Right. Today is Wednesday, May 16th, 2018, and we are at the Moline Public Library in Moline, Illinois. My name is Jan LaRoche. I will be interviewing Jerome Thomas for the Illinois Veterans History Project on behalf of the Mo Moline Public Library. Jerome was born on June 12th, 1957, and is 60 years old. Also present is Kathy Thomas. All right, so first of all, uh, Jerome, thank you for being here and being willing to be part of this process. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us first a little bit about your life, um, your childhood before you entered the service. Where were you born? Who were your parents? Well, oh, we, lived, we lived in Erie. My, uh, my parents were John and Joy Thomas, uh, Joy Meyer Thomas. Uh, I was born in Sterling Home Hospital, which is now Sterling Home Apartments. Uh, like I say, we lived in Erie, and uh, lived in Erie up until I went through kindergarten, and we moved to Prophetstown. My dad worked for uh, Rock River Lumber and Grain, and uh, we lived in Prophetstown. I went grades uh, one through six in P-Town, and uh, my dad died in 1966 from cancer. Uh, 1969, my mom remarried Jim Thorpe, and we moved to Moline. Start out in Heritage when they were building John Deere Road down there the first time. And uh, went, I went to Wilson Junior High School, it was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And then Moline High School was three year then. And uh, I went there. Um, graduated in 75. Uh, I've got four brothers. Uh, one is now deceased, my older brother died of cancer. Um, and three younger brothers. Um, and my mom is also gone, she's been gone. 21 years, uh, died in a car accident. Um, Anyone else in your family uh, in the service? Uh, my next younger brother, John, was in the Navy for six years. And uh, after he got out, he kind of regretted getting out, but he's uh, he, he landed on his feet and he's doing well with electronics up in Wisconsin. So, And then uh, my two youngest brothers are twins and they were never in, uh, although uh, my one brother, Jamie, has been a police officer for 25 plus years in Moline. And that's what I'm doing now. So I've been a Moline police officer for 20 years since I retired. But, uh, and, well, I did the delayed enlistment program. Um, and uh, I actually enlisted in April of 75 and for delayed enlistment to go in in September 75. So I had the summer, did a summer job. And, building pallets up in Cordova for John Deere, but uh, and uh, went in the military in September 11th, actually, 1975, and uh, basic training, and then uh, I had seen this, uh, this uh, pararescue job at the recruiter, and uh, we kind of had a bet going, because he said, oh, you'd never make that, you'll never make that, and I was, you know, a pretty skinny kid, skinnier than I am now, but uh, uh, so we, we bet a steak dinner that I would make it, and uh, so I went in and like the first week of basic training, you volunteer, they give you a, uh, a physical agility test, PT test, uh, and uh, I think, uh, re remember, uh, you had to do the run, mile and a half run in combat boots, and you had like 11 minutes and 15 seconds to do it, and I did it in 11.09, <laughs> so it was very close. Uh, but, and then there was a swimming portion and, and calisthenics and whatnot, but I've done a lot of swimming. I was on a swim team in high school. Um, uh, so then, uh, yeah, straight out of basic training, I went into pararescue training, and uh, that was, uh, got out of basic in October, October 75, and then gr graduated pararescue school October 20th of 1976, so it was about a year long. Uh, included, uh, did an indoctrination training at, at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. It was eight weeks of physical conditioning and some basic anatomy and physiology and that kind of stuff, and uh, <clears throat> some introduction to mountain climbing and mountain rescue techniques. And then uh, went from there, went to Fort Benning, Georgia for Army Jump School. And then after Army Jump School, we went to Key West, Florida for the Army Combat Diver School. And then from there, we went all the way across the country to Fairchild, Washington, Fairchild Air Force Base for uh, Air Crew Survival School. 
And then from there went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where our, they called it the transition school, uh, uh, where we, um, we got our initial medical training. We did our field operations with you know land navigation, mountain rescue, to just all kinds of overland stuff. And then we had our air crew phase, which included aerial gunnery, uh, hoist operations, um, just, and just working on helicopters and fixed wings and airplanes. Graduated there and got assigned to uh, Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, with 55th Rescue Squadron, and um, stayed there until um, 1982. But uh, in between time, I'd, I'd got married from uh, uh, with. Uh, of a high school sweetheart back here and uh, moved her to Florida and it just we were way too young it just didn't work out uh, she uh, she stayed down there about four and a half months long enough to get pregnant and come home to visit and stayed and we realized we saw the writing on the wall and it was pretty it wasn't a big blow up with the with divorce and all but uh, that uh, that worked out, got a heck of a good son out of it. He just turned 40, so that really makes me feel old. Um, and gave me some grandkids too, gave us some grandkids. Um, so then, uh, uh, we had, uh, well, 1978, we, uh, there was a, uh, actually flew from Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle of Florida to, uh, Woodbridge, England was the final destination. We did it in three, a three ship of helicopters. And we flew up the East Coast uh, to Loring, Maine, and then across the southern tip of Iceland, or Greenland. And then we flew into Iceland. They actually made us change the air crews there and let the, let the guys we were delivering the helicopters to take them on into England. But it was like the third transatlantic crossing of uh, H-53 helicopters. And it was pretty cool. Uh, a lot of, in June, I didn't realize the icebergs were that numerous in the North Atlantic at that time of year. So then, um, probably the next big event was we had uh, deployed to uh, Central America, and we had some guys on aircraft on an aircraft carrier off the coast when the Sandinistas came to power in, uh, in uh, Nicaragua. And we had staged down there to uh, evacuate the embassy if needed. So. Uh, we were down there for uh, six, eight weeks, and uh, we all got back to Florida, decided we are going to have a big beach party there on Oklahoma Island by Destin, and uh, so we're down there having our party, and uh, uh, one of my co-workers, who happens to be my brother-in-law now, uh, brought his 17-year-old sister to a party with a bunch of PJs. That's what they call us, PJs, and uh, met, met my wife now, and uh, Six months later, we got married. It was not shocking wedding, <laughs> uh, but uh, that was 38 years and eight months ago, and uh, uh, and we had uh, we've had three kids. Uh, we lost uh, lost our uh, lost our oldest. He was uh, uh, profoundly deaf, and moderately mentally retarded, and had a lot of physical anomalies. Uh, lost him to cancer seven years ago. But then we got another son <coughs> and, uh, and a daughter, and they're up here in the area and uh, doing well, 30-year-old Jared's working for the city of Moline in IT, and uh, 28 year old Janice is out the uh, Holiday Express as a front desk manager, supervisor, supervisor. <coughs> so, anyway, uh, I met Kathy in, in uh, 79, August, and then we got married in March of 80. Uh, JT was JT, our, our uh, some we lost was born uh, August of '81, um, but uh, I traveled a lot, uh, deployed a lot. We were always doing exercises. Uh, flew cross country in a helicopter many times, going to Las Vegas for the uh, red flag exercises, which 
you know, I play a lot of war games, fighters, and rescue exercises and whatnot. And uh, uh, then in 1982, uh, I was assigned to Iceland, Keflavik Naval Air Station, with the rescue detachment up there, and we did a lot of North Atlantic rescues, uh, uh, classified evacuations off of uh, American submarines. Um, we dealt a lot with uh, the Russian fishing fleet because the warm water port of Murmansk is up on the north side and they would come down through the straits either side of Iceland and that's also where all the, the Russian military vessels would go so that's why the base was there and uh, we did, uh, did a lot of missions off of, uh, off of Iceland, H-3 helicopters uh, all over the North Atlantic. Uh, Gosh, I can't remember how many we did, uh, but it was a steady, steady job up there. And then um, in late uh, 83, first part of 84, came back to Florida, uh, Eglin again, and uh, we stayed there doing uh, the rescue thing. And then Air Force Special Operations Command was starting to get going, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, well, Actually, even before that, there was uh, the, the, um, with the Iranian hostages. Uh, after Desert One, there was a lot of activity with Special Operations down around Robert Field, Maglin Air Force Base, and uh, actually worked uh, for and with the guy that uh, was actually the first guy on the ground to set up, that, set up the uh, landing zones and whatnot inside Iran. Um, And got to got, got to do a lot of interesting things there, and uh, meet a lot of interesting people. Um, that uh, yeah, that was the early days of uh, special operations. And then we slowly our career field we slowly became uh, uh, involved in besides conventional rescue. We had uh, we developed special tactics squadrons, which were uh, Air Force combat controllers and Air Force pararescuemen. And we uh, deployed a lot with a lot of different uh, other service units, uh, the Army and the Navy, uh, to provide them uh, close air support through the combat controllers. They could handle the, the call for fires from anything, from a fast mover to a gunship to a helicopter gunship to whatever. And then we provided the medical, uh, uh, the, uh, the mission in Grenada when they, uh, when the army went in and seized that island and got those students out, they discovered that working with the army, that was the primary force. They had Air Force combat controllers because they were going to land airplanes. Well, there was a disconnect between the uh, the, the medics the army had out there and getting the casualties collected and evaluated and, and evacuated. So that's you know, pararescue got more into that role. And I was lucky enough to get on the ground floor of that and did a lot of, uh, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that training. Again, I was gone, I averaged 250 to 260 days a year gone from home. And, you know, three weeks here, four weeks here, you know. And uh, so then in 1989, when uh, we invaded Panama during Just Cause, uh, I jumped in with the, uh, 3rd Ranger Battalion at, uh, I will, hold on, it, it just brings up something bad that happened, uh, I'll get through this. Um, so, uh, uh, Rio Hata was a small airfield on the west coast of Panama in the middle of the jungle, and uh, that's where Noriega's Battalion 2000 was headquartered. And that was his special forces. So to keep them out of the fight in Panama City, where uh, the other two, uh, the first and third, or first and second Ranger Battalion, and then the entire 82nd Airborne Division jumped in on on Tierra de Cumin, the main air, airfield of Panama City, and uh, we went to keep the uh, Battalion 2000 out of the fight, and uh, uh, we jumped in at uh, 450 feet at night under fire, and uh, something I did not find out until uh, just last Christmas. 
uh, I was on the number two airplane over the drop zone, and uh, a guy, four guys behind me got shot inside the airplane before we jumped. And, uh, I, uh, you know, you see the tracers and you see that kind of stuff going on, but uh, it's just not real the first time. It's, it's you know, it's, it's going on, but it's, it's not real. And then when, you, when something like that happens, then you <clears throat> kind of brings it home. Um, then on the airfield, well, I had a, we were getting shot at by a, a 50 caliber machine gun that was on a Jeep, and uh, I collided, or he collided. Another jumper collided with me and, and uh, stole my air from my parachute. So there's a, like a negative, uh, negative air pressure above a parachute as it's descending. I, I got into his negative zone and it stole my air, so my parachute collapsed. Before it fully reinflated, I hit the ground and I uh, herniated two discs in my back. And uh, I did what every good PJ would do, and I self-medicated and, and stayed uh, stayed on the airfield. And I was responsible for uh, finding the casualties. There was, there was uh, gunshot wounds and, and jump injuries uh, from the Army guys. So, spread out all over the airfield and tended those and uh, later on when we got got some vehicles on the ground uh, we had to go back and collect up all those guys and get them a casualty collection and, and once we started landing airplanes we got the vehicles and we had airplanes to put them on and get them out uh, worked a, worked a bad situation first light the next morning we jump at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and uh, first light, there was a, I was on the airfield, there was a firefight just off the airfield and, and uh, the Army had, had called in some uh, helicopter gunships and one of them fired short and shot up the Rangers. So I responded to that and uh, it didn't turn out well. Um, couple of KIAs there. I had an interaction with one of them before he died and it was just still bugs me. But he'd been hit with a rocket and, and minigun, 7.62 minigun fire and uh, his one arm was completely gone. Most of the other one was gone. I remember seeing his wedding ring because that was the only hand he had left and it was barely attached. The bone was all gone. It just all shot in the middle with, with large caliber rounds. Um, we got him out alive, but he died on the airplane on the way back to Howard Air Force Base in Panama. Um, But yeah, we had a we had a brief exchange of words, and uh, so anyway, that mission we stayed out there for three and a half days, and. Uh, Got back to Howard the uh, Christmas Eve day, and uh, Howard Air Force Base is in Panama. And then I finally got over and had some x rays done on my back and <laughs> realized it wasn't a good thing. Um, but um, it was kind of neat because uh, Christmas morning we woke up, we went to the combat control squadron down there, and uh, we were sleeping in their building, and uh, which was better than the sidewalk out in 80 degree heat out in the jungle. So sleeping in their building, we wake up Christmas morning and uh, overnight the uh, first special operations wing had flown a uh, C-130 Talon, combat Talon down and uh, brought care packages from home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my wife took good care of me. Sent me, sent me goodies for Christmas. So we had Christmas down there at, uh, Howard, um, and then uh, we, we 
handed off the mission to conventional forces, and we, we came home. And uh, uh, that was uh, first exposure to uh, combat, and uh, it just it was very significant. And it, it just uh, you know you go through your career and you learn all this stuff about combat rescue and, and doing all this cool stuff. And chicks dig it, and you know you you're just doing your thing, and and you kind of kind of want to kind of start rooting for a war so you can go do your stuff, and then you get there and you realize how wrong you are and how wrong you were, and uh, you don't want to root for that stuff because real people die, and they die in some pretty horrible ways. Um, uh, there was, yeah, there was some bad stuff there. Um, so anyway, we get back, and you know, we pretty much proved our concept. And uh, uh, now this is 20, 29 years later. Uh, the Air Force has really run with it. The whole special operations community has run with it, and uh, it's quite a uh, quite a force over in uh, in Iraq and and. Uh, the Middle East conflict right now, and they're doing a lot of good things, saving a lot of lives, um, and um, working with all the all the different operators that are over there. Um, we just had a, we just took a trip down to Fort Walton Beach, where Eglin Air Force Base and Hobart Field are located, and, and uh, I hadn't been back in 20 years since I retired, and it was amazing the amount of money that. You know, they put into that place and, and how Eglin used to be the great big base and Herbert was kind of a Herbert Field, but now Herbert Field is just just an amazing place now. It's got uh, the special tactics. When I retired, we just had a few detachments and a couple squadrons, and now they've got a, they've got a whole wing and they've got squadrons all throughout the world, uh, you know, where you could, uh, we would graduate Pararescue classes of ten guys, maybe you know, a couple times a year. Now they're graduating huge classes of you know 20, 30, 40 guys. Uh, we never had officers before, but when we started working with combat control, where they had officers, um, we learned the advantage of having some officers in, in pararescue. So now we, they they brought in the combat rescue officer. That was about the time I retired. They were bringing those guys in, um, and. I, I can remember I remember one guy in particular who was a combat control officer. He was an Air Force Academy graduate, had been through combat control school, and he came to our squadron down at Herbert as a brand new second lieutenant. Well, he just pinned on a star. He just became a general. So that really made me feel old, and you know, that was uh, probably mid-90s, 96, 97, something like that. But he's a general now, so now I am old. Um, we, uh, gosh, after, uh, after Panama, came back, uh, deployed for, uh, Desert Shield, uh, we ended up with, uh, just a handful of guys, uh, in a, in a schoolhouse in Kuwait. And I got there just when we'd, we'd sent the initial force, and then they pulled all of our airlifts, so we couldn't get any more guys over there. I got there mm, first part of September, and they just moved the guys out of this old schoolhouse, and they're in some old construction trailers. And we had uh, three helicopters, three H-53 payload helicopters, and uh, air crews, about six air crews, and there was six F-16s. And that was it. And um, we knew the Iraqis were eight hours by tank away across the oil fields. So our plan, if they attacked, was not to attack back, but to run away. <laughs> so, but then just watch the whole buildup at King Fahd International Airport. Uh, as all the, all the troops rolled in, and uh, they had a 101-meter uh, air traffic control tower for the airfield. Well, it wasn't completed yet. The airfield wasn't done, the airport. And um, the only way up into this tower, 
300 and whatever feet, 100, 101 meters, was by stairs. So our combat controllers from Hurlburt were up in the top of that tower with man portable battery operated radios and they were running all this traffic of all these Army helicopters, all the Air, Air, uh, Air Force fixed wing, Navy, Marines, uh, just thousands of sorties a day. And they actually, at the height of it, they were handling more traffic with manned portable radios and no radar than uh, LaGuardia and uh, O'Hare combined. And uh, they, but it was all, most of it was all military. There was some of the uh, commercial flights that were just bringing in loads of army troops, but they were the, the big heavy lifts. And, and uh, but just deconflicting all that just by remembering where everybody is and stacking them up. And the controllers just did an amazing job. Uh, and if you ever wanted to go up, the, uh, the Saudi Arabian prince for that area, there was a telephone on top of the tower. And you could call to the states on that phone for free because the prince was picking up the bill. Well, all these thousands of people that were on the ground didn't have access to it, but we did. <laughs> But the caveat was if you went up the 101 meters up those stairs, you carried water and batteries. So you'd have a five gallon jug of water and you'd have a A3 bag, a duffel bag full of batteries for the radios. And that was, you had to pay your bill. So you carried those up and then you got to use the phone for, you know. We, we self-policed it pretty much 10, 15 minutes a call, but I was able to call my sweetie and, and uh, and then that, that eventually went away when the word got out that we had it and, and some general wanted, wanted us to share it, so the prince took it out. But, <laughs> but uh, and then uh, the, uh, the war kicked off and uh, it was quick. I mean, we had, uh, my roommate was uh, on, the, uh, on the mission, they went up in the daylight and uh, a two-ship helicopter formation escorted by F-15s, and, and they went up into Iraq and picked up a fighter pilot that had been shot down. Well, he was a distance runner, and he had ejected, and as soon as he hit the ground, he buried his parachute and his helmet and all of his gear, except his survival vest, and he started running. And he ran out of the area, and they, they figured he ran 15 to 20 miles in the desert in the daytime, and got out of the area. And uh, the guys went up, uh, Tom Bedard, um, and uh, Ben Pennington, uh, he's dead now, but uh, they flew up and they were coming, one of the neat stories that Tom tells about it, they were coming to a main road in Iraq and there was a military convoy on it. And the F-15 fighter lead asked the helicopter lead, you know, how you want to do it? You want to go around or you want to shoot our way through? And they said, well, let's just shoot our way through. So the F-15s, the E-models at that time, they were the new, you know, they just, developed the air-to-ground capability, and they just went and just blew everything up. And they went, picked up the guy, and got him out. I think, I think it was a distinguished flying cross mission. All of them, all of them got DFCs out of that, uh, and got him back. I ended up doing four different trips to the sandbox because uh, after the air war was over and the air, the ground war was was in the middle of it. Uh, the conventional guys, conventional rescue guys had moved in, so a lot of the special ops guys went home, some stayed, and then uh, I went back for other trips, uh, I think it was February of 92, the uh, daylight air raid on Baghdad, we had 86 airplanes going in to bomb downtown Baghdad during the daylight, and uh, we were... Uh, Wayne Jones and I were, were crewing together on, on one of the birds. We were the SAR, the combat search and rescue guys. And we went up to the border and we just flew up and down the border about 10 feet off the ground with two monstrous, uh, the H-53 is a big helicopter. And uh, we're flying up and down about 10 feet off the ground because every time we got any higher than that, we started getting tracked by all these missile sites and all these gun sites and we'd have to dive back down. And, and uh, it was a little, it was a tense 45 minutes because there was Air Force, Marine, and Navy uh, airplanes uh, attacking Baghdad. Well, the AWACS, the command and control bird, had picked up uh, 
what they thought was an ejection seat firing in downtown Baghdad. So we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, this is really going to suck. And uh, go downtown Baghdad in a day like that probably wouldn't have been a good idea. Um, so all the airplanes came back. They're trying to figure out if they got them all or if that was an ejection seat or what it was. Well, the Navy was a little slow because they had a couple carriers out there and they're recovering their airplanes. And uh, the first time they miscounted and then command had them recount. And then they figured out, okay, we got all the airplanes back. And they figured it was just a missile, that uh, any aircraft missile that fired in, in Baghdad. And uh, yeah, we had no losses on that mission, which was pretty awesome. So we, uh, yeah, 422 days I spent in the desert. Came back from there, and I remember we were, I was coming back. I was on the, uh, I was on a C5 Galaxy, great big transport airplane. We had two of the H-53 helicopters folded up inside the cargo hold, and we were uh, flying, uh, flying over the Mediterranean. I can't remember the name of the island with that volcano, uh, Etna, Mount Etna. It was still going off, and it was at night. And you could see all the lava flows and everything. And we were talking about Bosnia and all that stuff that was starting up there. And we thought, well, we ought to just land in Italy and hang out for that. Well, we get home, and, and it wasn't very long after that, we turned around and deployed back. And at first, we started off in country there on the Dalmatian coast, uh, Bosnia. And uh, they found out we had guns, so they said we couldn't stay. So they brought in an aircraft carrier, Teddy Roosevelt. and. Uh, we sailed up and down the Dalmatian coast for a couple months on an aircraft carrier, and it was, uh, you know, I didn't go in the Navy. I didn't, I, I didn't want to do that, but spent a lot of time on different aircraft carriers, um, but that was the longest. And then finally we moved off of there. We went into Italy and hung out there. Um, and then um, after all of that, that kind of calmed down the uh, that big mission where they they went in and got a oh, call sign was something three four and uh, it was actually uh, the special ops guys let in the conventional rescue helicopters and they actually got the pickup because the special ops helicopters had the nav nav aids the special navigation at that time it was it was uh, satellite navigation which was a, still a classified thing and. You know, there was gen general stuff the civilian world could get, but we had the stuff that we have now where it brings it right down to within feet. And uh, that was all classified back then, which is now, it's been all released and everybody, you get it on your phone. Um, uh, so then, just a lot of more exercises out of Florida. Went back to Iceland in 1995 with the Black Hawk helicopters and, and uh, flew more missions. Um, some, uh, again, stuff up on the glaciers, stuff, stuff out, mostly out in the North Atlantic with either freighters or uh, Russian fishing boats, which seem to have all these antennas on them. It was amazing. Why are trawlers out here with all these antennas? But they were watching us and we were watching them. Um, and then back to Florida and uh, ended up retiring in 98. But some of the neat things, I was just thinking about uh, the Muriel boat lift in about 1979. Were you, were you in Florida then? Mm -hmm. With Randy when we had all the Cubans? Mm -hmm. When Castro opened up all of his prisons and, and they, you know, all those people. Well, there at Eglin Air Force Base, her brother Randy and I, uh, we were just two enlisted par uh, pararescuemen. We were the medical the uh, medical force for a hangar full of 750 refugees. And uh, it was quite an entertaining time. It was tough until we found a Cuban doctor that had been one of the prisoners. Well, he got, he got to move his cot right next to our aid station. <laughs> so he was not only our interpreter, but he was also our, our doctor on hand. Um, and some of these folks you know, later on out at the fairgrounds, dealt with a guy that was a paraplegic and uh, just eaten up with bed sores because he was shot in the back when he was running from Cuban troops and uh, paralyzed. And they just they threw him in prison and 
to rot, and he literally was rotting. He was just in terrible shape. And just some of the people that just, the, the women, um, the women didn't, um, well, feminine hygiene. They didn't understand the concept of a tampon. So I didn't speak Spanish, they didn't speak English, and I'm trying to explain to them what to do with this. And we found out through the doctor later that they had been just using newspaper before for pads. And you know, it's just, just terrible, just the, the conditions that they, they got away from. And then uh, we were able to get them all processed through eventually and, and get them out uh, to different resettlement places. Um, what else did we have? We had, uh, oh. <laughs> Um, oh, I had some, I think I had some notes here. Uh, very elbow lift, um, just caused it. Uh, there was, there was one point, um, in my career where, uh, I talked about the Pablo helicopters. Well, they were H-53 helicopters that had a lot of high speed radar, terrain following, terrain avoidance radars, weather radars, real state-of-the-art stuff, uh, the satellite navigation. Well, at Eglin, we'd had the, uh, we had the 73 model helicopters. So we had the newest ones in the fleet. Well, once they proved the system and they started taking all of the helicopters for modification and upgrade, they took ours. So then we're sitting there with rescue unit and we only had C-130s, we didn't have any helicopters. So uh, the Coast Guard station in Destin was like the premier spot for the Coast Guard in, in, in their service. So we started pulling alert with them out there, and that was, that was tough duty. You know, you could go fish off their dock, or nobody else could fish off their dock. And, and, uh, but I got to hand it to the Coast Guard. There was, there was some missions that we went on. The Destin Pass was a notoriously dangerous place, and they actually lost one of their 41-footers in the pass. It hit the bottom. In a, in a the trough of a wave and capsized, and they lost two uh, two coasties on that. But uh, one night we were going out for a uh, disabled fishing boat. It was like 80 miles out in the Gulf, and uh, we were in storms and heavy seas, and we're in this little 41 foot boat, and lightning's going on everywhere, and uh, like uh, we keep going in this. I'm you know I'm up in the in the Boathouse, uh, talking to the, the coxswain or whatever, the boat driver, and he says, oh yeah, he says, we're in the Coast Guard. They say you have to go out. They don't say anything about you having to come back. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, I guess we're going to do that. But it, it did turn out all right. We, we ended up uh, uh, having a mechanical problem, and, and uh, we were adrift for a while, but they got all that fixed up. But that was a very interesting time in learning about the Coast Guard, and, and uh, the extremes that they operate in. Um, let's see, what else? Interesting things. We did, uh, well, I had, I ended up with a uh, total of 20, about a little over 2,500 flying hours, most of it in helicopters. I had uh, 452 military parachute jumps, half of them static line, about half static line, half free fall. Um, I lost my dive log book, so I, I don't know how many military dives I ended up with, but uh, uh, you know, it's a tough place to be to be a military diver in Florida. Yeah, it was, that was tough duty. Um, yeah. You have any questions? I mean, I, have I? Yeah, that's great. Um, did you want to tell us about some of the um, medals and awards that you received? Um, well, uh, Bronze Star was, was out of Panama for, uh, for that action. Um, uh, the meritorious service medals, those were mostly for, um, you know, for extended tours uh, at Holbert and, and Eglin, and I think there was one for Iceland, uh, for all, you know, they kind of combined it all. Uh, we, had, uh, we had an interesting uh, wing commander for uh, most of my time. Both of my tours in Iceland, uh, they just had an attitude of, well, you're just doing your job, so 
uh, where uh, a lot of a lot of the units back in the states were getting these air medals for all this and that and the other thing. And I ended up with like seven air medals that were declined because we were just doing our job. We did uh, night water uh, night water hoist missions to get uh, different casualties off. Uh, we went out to uh, the submarine missions, especially the boomers, the the nuclear. Uh, missile carrying subs. Um, they would give us, we had a, we had one where there was a, a, a just a humanitarian leave, uh, sailors, a member of his family died and we had to go get him off the boat. Well, they could just give us, they just gave us a, a direction and distance and just fly out there and wait. Okay, so we'd fly out there and start orbiting. We, 240 miles out from shore, and then we're just boring holes in the sky in a circle, and then pretty soon you see the periscope and then the conning tower of a submarine come up. And uh, the seas were fairly calm. There was a few swells coming through, so we were going to do an aft deck pickup, aft hatch, which is right where the prop is and the rudders and everything, and just forward of that, there's a hatch. So. I start down on the hoist, and uh, I see the, the hatch open and the two rescue swimmers, they're in anti-exposure suits, and they're tethered into the sub. They come out and they sit on the side of the hatch, and I look down and, and see coming up the ladder is this uh, Navy dude in his dress blues or whatever, and uh, about that time the hoist stopped, and I, I looked up the flight engineer that's running the hoist, and he's like looking, you know, pointing, and I look and there's a rogue wave coming. And uh, it, it hit the back of the sub. It took the two rescue swimmers over the side. And the last thing I see of this Navy guy in his blues, his eyes just filled up the hatch and it just flushed him back down in. And uh, so when the wave subsided, the uh, rescue swimmers, you see them hanging on the side of the water going over. And when it quit, they finally climbed back up on the boat. And uh, then you see the guy coming back. <laughs> He's silken wet. And uh, you know, what a way to start emergency leave. But. Uh, and then we would do um, the dive planes on the side of the conning tower to, so they can dive the sub. We would hoist to those in heavy seas. And that was always interesting because we'd get down on the sailplane and then we'd have, it was probably you know, five or six feet up and over into the conning tower to get to the patient or whatever. And, and uh, there was one time when I got on there to, to take a guy off, uh, just a broken arm, but it was an open fracture and uh, forearm, and uh, the helicopter needed to go get gas, so they air refuel. And uh, so the sub says, well, we can't stay on the surface. So they closed up the sub and they dove. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> and I'm just hoping, you know, airplanes break or they can't get fuel or things happen. And, you know, I could just, you know, I got visions of me being on this boat, you know, on this submarine. And, uh, but it all turned out well. They came back and they picked me up. Um, we had uh, <laughs> we had one, one Russian fishing trawler in 83. And whenever we went out over the North Atlantic, uh, if we were going down the hoist, we would wear dry diving suits. And, you know, neck seals and all that, you know, just they're hot until you get in the cold water and then they're great. But, uh, so I got my, I got my uni suit on and, uh, it was, uh, I think it was me and Dan Daly. And uh, we, they put us down on the deck, and we got to go like four decks down in this boat where this, this uh, sailor had been caught in a uh, engine room fire. And he was steam burns and thermal burns, and he was just in bad shape. And then we're trying to get him back up four decks to the, to the top so we can hoist him off. Well, again, the helicopter had to go get gas. And I had a moment where I was thinking, boy, I sure hope they don't break because I'm going to have to stay in this dry suit because I was wearing a t-shirt that said, kill a commie for Christ. And I'm like, this is not a good place to have that t-shirt. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and Russians, if they don't speak English, they do exactly what we do. Okay? He, this guy stuck his head in when we were, we were starting IVs and stuff on a patient. He stuck his head in the door and he blah, 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 in Russian. And I'm like, huh? He said it again, louder and slower in Russian. 
it's like we do with English. If we say it louder and slower in English, they'll understand it. But nope. Um, but it was uh, it was interesting. Um, I mean, you know, when it's humanitarian like that, you know, it, it's just all that because that was that was Cold War stuff, and that was Reagan's time, and and uh, it was uh, they treated us really well. You know, anything we needed, they were there. And uh, but different world. You know, when it comes down to people, that's that's what I discovered. Like in Panama and in over in the desert, uh, you know, they're people, and they got issues just like we got issues, and and uh, it's uh, not that different. Just a different language and different culture. But anyway. Um, yeah, it was. Um, oh, we did. We did a lot of different things. Uh, uh, well, a couple of those combination medals that I got, we saved the uh, we saved the Air Force a bunch of money down there at Eglin because they had this huge uh, cable that services serviced all the radar sites and test sites out on Okaloosa Island, and it ran underneath Choctahatchee Bay. Well, it was lead encased wires, and it was pressurized with nitrogen. Well, they had an issue with one of the cables, uh, a fishing trawler or something that drug a net and, and snagged one of the junction boxes and it was leaking and they're going through excessive amounts of nitrogen to keep it pressurized. So they need it pulled up so they can fix it. Well, they talked to the Navy and the Navy said, well, we got one that we're doing. We're just going to use a crane and pick it up. Well, it's kind of buried in the sand. You know, and they, they're just going to pull it up to a boat, fix it and put it back down. Well, we didn't think that would work. We thought it would break. Well, the navies did break, but that was after we started our technique, and we uh, uh, they called us jack of all trades. Uh, so we we got down there. It was probably I don't know, 15, 20 feet of water. It wasn't very deep, but a sandy bottom, and we took fire hoses underwater and just used the fire hose to blow the sand off the cables. And we took 55 gallon drums and aircraft tie down straps. We strapped them to this cable out both directions and slowly started filling them with a spare air tank. And then we just floated the thing up and we got 100 foot of it on the surface and they would pick it up, slide a barge under, fix it. And uh, we did that two years in a row and we saved the Air Force so much money they gave us medals. So, yeah, that was a pretty good deal. Um, had uh, what the Air Force termed was a hard landing in a helicopter. That was a bad week. That was September of 1980, right? No, 79. 79. September of 79, first week of September. Hurricane Fredericks coming in to the Florida Panhandle. Uh, my starter wife, ex-wife, was coming down for a visit. My enlistment, my first four-year enlistment was about to be up. She wanted to see if we were gonna be able to figure things out. And I'd come back here and go work for John Deere or something. And uh, so she's, coming into the Oakland County Airport down there. And I'm out getting a check ride, an evaluation ride. And we've been out over the water uh, shooting mini guns. And uh, then we're going in over land and we're going to do an intentional tree jump. So we're starting to get rigged up. And uh, uh, there's four windows down the side of the H-53. And if you get an oil leak, we, they term it by how many windows. Well, we had a four four window leak. It was running all the way down the side of the airplane, running off the back, and it was smoking up on the engine, and then it caught fire. And then it, uh, so the pilot was going to make emergency landing. We're scrambling to get in seat belts, and uh, the uh, it took out the flight control, the automatic, they call it APHIS, automatic flight control system that takes the pilot's inputs and smooths them out and you know delivers it to the hydraulics to control the airplane. Well, they lost that, so they're really hand flying it and it's difficult to control. We go into this clearing, we hit, and it was actually in slow motion because I was sitting on the right, right back side of the airplane and I could see out the left gunner's window. And we hit and we started to roll up like that and the nose landing gear collapsed and we're sliding, and I could all, I could count the rotor blades as they came by. I'm watching them, and they're they're getting closer. I can see the sand kicking up off the ground, and they got <laughs> so close to the sand, and uh, 
And then it all settled back down and then there's smoke everywhere and guys are grabbing fire extinguishers and we're running away. And I was fine until I ran out the ramp, the back ramp of the helicopter, or right where the nose landing gear had turned sideways and collapsed, there was a huge hole. Yeah, I ended up in there and I had tore up my ankle. So. And then we had a rescue helicopter. We had to call the, uh, the there was an Air Force test wing down there and they had some uh, UH-1 Hueys and they would you know, just support their range work with that. Well, we had to call the test wing to come rescue, rescue. One of the guys got thrown around, he hurt his back and, uh, and then with my ankle, so they had to fly us out to the hospital and it was a little embarrassing, but uh, um, I don't know. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing your stories with us and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Was I getting long-winded? No, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All uh, right.